I'm Patrick Moore. I'm Marlisa McLaughlin. And welcome to Health Buzz. Perspectives on natural health. Well, we have a real buzz about our Health Buzz show today because we're going to be talking about bees, mankind's best friends. Sometimes we take these bees for granted. They buzz around and we don't really pay attention to them, but they play a critical and crucial role in mankind's economic welfare. Up to one third of all our vegetables, fruits are pollinated, including blueberries and raspberries and strawberries and oranges and apples. All of the nuts and seeds and oils require pollination from the bees. If we take a look at our, what we ingest in the morning, our coffee, chocolate, tea, all of those require pollination. Even our cattle and cows, the fodder and the alfalfa, are all dependent on bees and pollinating these crops and plants. In fact, it's estimated that if bees were to disappear, where would we be? Mankind might collapse, actually, because we wouldn't have all these foods that we need for nutrition. But we're going to be exploring in our show today exactly what's going on with bees and the struggle for survival they're having right now because they're being compromised by a lot of the environmental factors that are disturbing their hives. So we have a special guest for you today. We actually have two special guests. Our first guest, Marlisa, would you do the honors? Yeah, we have a, a great guest today. We have your former mayor of Groton. She is a community activist, and she is here to tell us a little bit about being one of the founders also of the Noank School Public Garden, Heather Summers. Welcome, Heather. Welcome. Thank you for having me today. This, it's exciting to be here, and um, I am a bee enthusiast. Uh, I became introduced to bees when I had an old house when I lived in Waterford, Connecticut, and in the back was a small little shed. And I finally ventured in there one day, and it was covered in bees. And I thought, hmm, how am I going to get, I'm going to have a lot of cleaning out to do. And my neighbor said, oh, no, you can't do that. These are honeybees. You have to have a bee keeper come and uh, get rid of the bees or take them to a hive. And that was my first touch with bees. And since that time, we've been very active in the Noank Public Community Garden. And we have two beehives on the property. And it's been exciting to learn about bees. I'm fascinated by everything that they do. And um, I'm excited to be here today to talk about all the wonderful things bees do for our world, our earth, and, and for us as humans. Mm, great. So that garden, could you talk a little bit more about it, the educational factors Absolutely. behind it? Absolutely. Um, the Noank School Public Garden is a garden located in Noank, Connecticut. It was a former school site. And uh, when the school became um, in a condition where it had to be taken down, the community got together, a task force was formed, and the community decided what they wanted to do with the land. The land is beautiful. It used to be an orchard years ago. You can actually see the water from the land if you uh, get up high enough. And the community overwhelmingly said, this land needs to be preserved. And a group came uh, to the council at the time and said, we want to make this a public garden for the community. So right now, uh, we have 210 small Christmas trees on the property. We have two beehives. There are plots that you can rent to grow your own garden vegetables if you don't have space nice. at your home. And we're going to eventually be returning it to its original use, which will be an orchard. It will be a park. It's just in its infancy stages right now. But if you're interested, get involved. And it's, it's got great energy. As it you sure said, you does. That was amazing. I had the great fortune of happening upon the garden without having any idea it existed. And it really does generate, when you just come up over the hill and see that property, an amazing sense of care. I just, it's just Absolutely. wonderful. So congratulations Thank on that. Thank you. It's exciting. It's, it's actually the hard work of many people. I just recently um, was put on the board. Um, I was promoting it when I was on the council and the mayor, but I'm, there was a lot of other people, Clint Wright and uh, Robert Palm, that were actively involved in really generating this idea. And I'm really excited to see it come to fruition. It's, it's great for the community. So please, if you're out there watching, come visit it. Well, Heather, you know, it seems, I mean, that's great educationally, but it seems like in our society today, I mean, we're getting so much into technology, digital. We don't have that relationship with nature that our ancestor did. You know, what is it that, uh, I mean, what is your opinion about the bee kingdom itself and its significance and role in our society and survival? Well, as we were talking before, um, I think that bees are, you don't realize that they're such an integral part of our food supply, of, um, you know, there's medicinal properties of um, honey that are um, just becoming much more popular or recognized in the medical community. But um, as you said, without bees, without the pollination, without the crops, without the fruit, 
without um, you know, alfalfa and things that we feed our cow, it really has a direct effect on us as humans and we need to take seriously the demise that we're seeing in the bee population. So I'm excited to be able to have this conversation. I know you wanna go through the history of bees and we'll explain to everybody how uh, the society of the beehive works, which is fascinating. Um, sometimes I wish my household would work that way <laughs> because it's so organized and clean. Um, but it's really, really interesting and you can, you can it's, some of the facts about bees are just amazing, so I think we can touch on some of those today. Yeah, well, the, uh, it seems to me that history says that bees developed almost 100 million years ago, and they developed in terms of a relationship with wildflowers. The more wildflowers proliferated to attract the bees, and the bees got the nectar, and I mean, it's just an amazing evolution we've seen over the years. In fact, bees originated from wasp, is that, is that correct? From wasp. wasp. Right. Mm. Wasp were carnivorous, and then I think they, they still are herbivorous. Is that pronounced <laughs> properly? <laughs> yes, herbivorous. herbivorous. Thank you. And yeah, wasps so, give a nasty sting, and bees are lovely that compared to wasps. Oh, so. okay. So we can cover ourselves. <laughs> there with them, we right? go. Exactly. Aren't you telling me there's new facial treatments or something? Well, I've like heard that. that. I just I heard, heard about that it or you something. You can get bee venom, and it gets rid of your lines. I don't yeah. know if that's true, but uh, <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of new um, ideas coming up for bee products and. Um, one of the most fascinating, um, I guess, items about bees is just the way that the whole hive works together. Yeah. I know you're going to touch, touch on that. It's fascinating how they communicate, how far they go. Like you said, they actually have helped um, wildflowers pr proliferate. Yeah. And you know, I'm sure new wildflowers and the fragrance, there's so much that's involved and it's so intricately um, fine-tuned even at this point yeah. and uh, I think the audience would love to hear some of the yeah, well, interesting we facts. We really take them for granted, don't we? We do. Bees? You don't think about it. No. Do you think when you go to the store and you buy a bag of coffee that if we didn't have bees we would not have, you know, or have we would have coffee. have that bite of chocolate, right? Exactly. Exactly. Or a cup, sip that cup of tea or all those breakfast foods right. we have and things like that. My goodness, I mean we really take it for granted. And I actually never really thought about it before I started to get more interested and I learned more about the hives that they were doing in Noink and how effective they are by the environmental uh, pesticides and, and certain diseases that are out there that can destroy hives. And when you start thinking about it and you know how many bees it takes to make such a small amount of honey, we really need to be conscious as humans of what we're doing to these bees. Yeah, because 556 life, bees to make one teaspoon of honey That's yeah. and 55,000 traveled miles within a four mile radius. Yeah. I, that just blew my mind. It is yeah. amazing. It is and really so, amazing. And beekeeping goes back so far, you were you're mentioning that, back to like the, the first um, proof of beekeeping was uh, six to 8,000 BC in Valencia, Spain. We yeah. actually have a diagram, there it is, the cave painting. It's amazing, beautiful. So that, that far back. So that's dated 6,000? Six, six, six to 8,000 BC. So okay, that could be up to 10,000 years ago. That's an, an amazing process. It almost looks process. like there's a woman climbing up. It does, up doesn't there. it? Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. I know in Egypt, the beekeepers, it goes back 6,000 mm -hmm. years almost to a recorded history. In so there's a little... The beekeepers. But who knows? This could have been going on for ten thousands of years. I mean, survival, honey, exactly. Bones. I mean, everybody was after those. Honey I'll tell you, the first time I ever uh, tasted actual honeycomb, they served it in when I was in Turkey uh, for breakfast, and they had it served on a special metal um, holder, and the honeycomb, you know, was held, and it just dripped the honey, and oh. you could break a little piece, oh. and you had it with your coffee or tea, oh, nice. and it was one of the most fabulous things I have ever tasted in my entire life. Wow. It sounds beautiful It was also. gorgeous. Just but at, and at first, we, we're not used to that in this country, no. so I said, what is that? Yeah, and then comb, the yeah, actual comb. The, the whole comb. comb, and it was dripping honey. And um, they have honey, um, they have hives, and in, in when I've spent a lot of time in the Nordic countries and in, in Turkey on the top of hotels, you see them on the top of the roofs. Oh, there. that's so, so cool. So it's really interesting. They try to you know, proliferate the bees wherever they can there. Yes. So. yes. I know in the United Kingdom, there's now uh, paying farmers to grow wildflowers so that they can attract more bees and you know have more food sources and things wow. like that. They're actually incentives to all the farmers just to do that in any unused land because they know mm -hmm. the importance of the bees for pollination. Well, maybe that's something we should think for our state. We could throw them in the middle of the medians. We could, wildflowers are easy to grow. I have they them all over my yard. Right. You just kind of toss the seeds and they yeah. grow. You should, you should start a wildflower there growing you go. campaign. And, Save the bees. You there know. you go. And they are beautiful too. Yeah. So, 
So let's talk about that inner world of that hive and how it works. I mean, you're fascinated and pretty I awestruck know. about that social. You said the you wish your household network, ran that I way, do. right? Yes, I'm sure most people do. There's one queen bee. Can you imagine why I, I, I would like that idea? <laughs> and, and everyone listens to her. Now, there's one queen bee, and you know you guys pipe in because you know just as much as I do. There's the drones, which are the males. And yeah, we actually have a diagram of the three bees. As you speak, Heather, we might be able to sure. and there's, take a peek um, at that. The worker bees. The worker bees are sterile females. They're the ones that go out and do all the work. They collect the pollen. They tend to the bee, uh, the queen bee. They, they feed her. They... Um, you know, make sure that she's in good uh, form. And they're the ones that actually protect the hive also. They will not sting you unless they are agitated or, yeah, you know, right. you go yeah. after them. And once they sting, they die, unfortunately. But uh, those little, those little uh, worker bees go out, I think it's a three to four mile radius, to collect pollen and bring it back to the hive. And, and they collect it by their fur, the yellow spot on the bottom of the leg there on the worker bee is the, um, the pollen that's rubbed up against and... Yeah, I think one of the most fascinating things Patrick was saying earlier is they have this whole way to communicate. So if a worker bee finds this great source of uh, pollen and nectar, tell them what they were doing. Well, we're going to see it with our okay. guests later with our queen bee. <laughs> they actually do a dance, all kinds of dancing in terms of their communi communications to uh, let them other worker bees know mm -hmm. how far away the source is. There's one other thing that goes on. I read that they have headbutting. The other bees, if they disagree with that waggler, the dancing, no, they, they go do. and headbutt it. <laughs> and say, oh, you're wrong about the, the location. The mosh pit of the hive. They're actually headbutting them. <laughs> that's yeah, hilarious. So that's it's fun. a remarkable, you know, communications that's going on. We're going to have an example mm -hmm. of that later right. in the show. But it, the, hive, the hive system is fascinating because yeah. the queen lays her eggs and um, the worker bees take care of her and the drones are there to obviously mate with the queen. But when the drones are done, they're, they're out of the hive. Um, you know, it, the bees actually go outside to die so they don't make the hive dirty. Um, it's this very organized system and it's amazing to me that the worker bees know, okay, it's my time, I'm supposed to be grooming the queen. No, I'm supposed to be collecting pollen. No, I'm supposed to be feeding the young. How they all know this naturally is just amazing. Uh, you know, if that could work in a household, wouldn't it be great for all of us? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody would know what they're supposed to do. Yeah, I mean, it is incredible. So. I was re doing some research and it was funny to see that um, the, you, you mentioned the UK and there was a great blogger and he was talking about the, how he was describing the bees and he was talking about the drones and how they were just kind of slothy almost hanging out, just, you know, they were mating with the queen and drinking the nectar and it, it was such a great humoristic way to approach. Right. In the same way you're talking about it, it's exactly. such an in intricate little system. It's amazing, it really is. And you know, I think that um, there's some misunderstanding. We, we run into that at the, at the garden in Noank that people are afraid, oh, if there's beehives, I'm, I'm going to get stung. But um, one of the things that I learned is that, um, you know, bees will leave you alone. The, the reason that people um, do get stung is when an, an, a human approaches the hive, bees tend to see this big, dark figure and they think it's a bear. Mm -hmm. And we were told that's why beekeepers wear the white outfit because the bees can recognize that. So if you just stay away from their hive, they're pleasant and happy collecting pollen and they're not going to bother you whatsoever. And uh, that whole system is, is quite something. Now this whole system now, I mean, over the last 10 years, they've been talking about this uh, colony collapse disorder. Absolutely. It's called colony mm -hmm. collapse disorder where bees are starting to die prematurely and disappear and mm -hmm. things like that. I mean, it, it really seems to, uh, I was reading a statistic that in the last four years, the uh, 250 billion bees worldwide have died prematurely or are missing, wow. missing in action. Mm -hmm. Four years, a quarter of a trillion bees. And uh, a lot of the beekeepers are reporting that this past winter, one third of their bees died off, you know, a huge percentage. So uh, That's scary because if you think about it, yeah. you know, bees um, basically pollinate 80% of our crops here yeah. on the earth. So. If we have that collapse, that doesn't say much for uh, what the future holds. So I think we need to take things seriously as far as what we can do to save the bees. I know today there was a, a protest outside of the EPA where... Um, the Environmental Protection Environmental, Agency in right, Washington, D.C. Right. right, where a group brought, uh, I think it was 2.6 million dead bees to the front doorstep and said, you know, it's time for you to recognize that the use of certain pesticides 
is correlated to the bee collapse. And you know, for sustainability of the human race, we need to make sure that bees survive. So it's time for you to really take this seriously, and we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, well, f f on that same subject, fortunately, as we were talking about before, Aldi, the, the major supermarket chain in Germany, mm -hmm. is banishing any of these pesticides for any of their stores. And of course, that's they're, throughout the United States, they're expanding. And along with glyphosate, the uh, Roundup, uh, Monsanto's mm -hmm. Roundup weed mm -hmm. killer. So that's a big step. Lowe's and Home Depot also are banishing it. And we, so we talked about before, ortho, that makes uh, Scott's miracle grow. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of progress. Right being made, you know. So, so large corporations are recognizing the, the issue too, so yeah. that's a good thing. And public awareness. Mm -hmm. I found that in discussing this and bringing this up with people and talking with my friends prior to the show, yeah. many, many people were talking about that awareness of the mm -hmm. bee collapse and, <coughs> and Excuse the me, impacts. they know about this collapse and bees are disappearing, but they don't really know what's happening exactly. or how to get involved or what they can right. do. Well, I guess one of the good things you could do to start right away is you could um, curb your use of pesticides. There are natural ways that you can, um, you know, repel certain insects that you might want not want in your garden. Um, there are certain oils, etc., that you can use that are not pesticides. You could plant a lot of wildflowers. That helps the bees. You know, I know at our house we um, got rid of a bunch of cedar trees and we planted Rosa rugosa, which I have to do a shout out for because it grows quickly and it looks beautiful, it's fragrant, and the bees love it. So, um, you know, in a place where there was no action of bees, now um, we have bees going through this hedge like crazy, and it's really fascinating to see. You can actually see them, because the flowers are big enough, you can see them trying to pick up the pollen, and it's, it's great, it really is. And, uh, and they spread everything around, so you have Rosa Rugosi growing where you didn't think you would have it next year, <laughs> but... Um, uh, those are the types of things that everybody could do just to make a difference and get involved in the public gardens. You can actually have your own um, little hive and keep bees in your yard if you want. Um, so there's many, many things that you can do um, to help. And, and recognizing and teaching your children about the importance of bees, those are all things I think that are very important for us and our future generations here. So grow more wildflowers. Yes. And you're suggesting everybody have or consider having a hive if you know you how they to. would do that, or how do you start? How do you yeah, get a you hive? actually. Um, we, my husband and I thought about doing that this year, but yeah. we're just a little tied up with things going on, so we just don't have the time. But um, you actually order your bees. You you get a hive, and you can buy the systems, and you order so you, your bees, you and they get delivered. Them. And um, they they actually like the ones in Noink. They're like a box, and and you they you can pull them the out top. in slats. Yeah. And um, you have to be. Um, they have to be fed in the winter in New England because it's so cold. I mean, in the winter, bees get together and they flap their, their wings to keep warm and they use up all the pollen that they've brought um, in for the, for the season. And, uh, but sometimes they need a little help, so beekeepers here tend to feed them a little bit just to get them going in the winter. And sometimes at that time they will treat them for a particular mite that's a real problem here in Connecticut. Um, and then as they start to I, mean, I think it's March where they start to like wake up and, and get out of the hive a little bit. Um, once they start bringing in their own you know, pollen and feeding themselves, um, they're slowly weaned off and uh, the beekeepers uh, keep the honey that's collected during the time where they're treated. They don't use that honey and then eventually uh, they can collect the honey uh, for themselves a little bit and keep the rest for the hive. But um, I have a couple friends that have hives. Yeah. and. Uh, they have been stung a few times, and it's a learning curve. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I think it's amazing. They, you don't, it's hard, you don't get much honey, because as you said, I think it's fascinating how many bees it takes to make one teaspoon of honey. Think yeah. about that the next time you take a yeah. big scoop of honey. Um, but it's, it's really rewarding, and uh, you're doing something good for the earth. Yeah. Very important. Very good, getting <laughs> very involved. Did, did you know they also, um, out in California where the almonds are growing, oh, and they wow. had a problem with the almonds, and the bees not pollinating enough, they actually brought in extra truckloads of beehives. Yeah. Have you seen those? Millions. They're trucking them in the from truck, far off. Yeah, it's just the, amazing. Yeah. I think somebody told me that they actually have like traveling hives like that, where they come in, they pollinate, yes. and then they move them around, yes. which is also fascinating. Yeah, kind of like the chicken coops we talked about once. I didn't know they, they had those portable either. So I didn't know that. That's yeah, because of the scarcity of the bees, too. I mean, prices mm -hmm. are going up. and. Actually, robberies are expanding in California dramatically because people are stealing other people's hives. And no way. Like, yeah, steal the hives because they can make a lot of money on the open market. So it's a real problem mm -hmm. right now because of the scarcity and diminishment of the bee population.
Wow, one thing that I, I have learned, um, especially in the garden, we had a bee expert come um, and speak, and one of the things he said you can do for your community is to buy local, buy from a local beekeeper. Most of the beekeepers um, sell some of their honey, and you can, and sometimes you can actually taste the different flower in the honey because of what's grown locally. And to be leery of um, honey that is very inexpensive on the market because you have to really look what's in it. There's many overseas production houses that feed their uh, bees to sugar and water so what they're producing is not it's not the honey that you would get with all the benefits that you have here in this yeah. country so to be careful buy local it helps the local community and helps sustainability of the of the bees that we have Excellent. here. So Maybe I that's a good I'd point to go into the medicinal benefits. I, think I was just thinking yeah, about that. Benefits of honey since we're on to that. So uh, it's, first of all, it tastes great, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's we know why Pooh Bear itself. was always in the hive, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love honey. And uh, also the royal jelly, which is the highest quality that's just fed to the queen. You know, we use that every day. I use that every day in my family, and it's just beautiful. Yeah, the royal jelly, like you said, is the uh, pollen. It's ground up pollen. And it's also the, um, they call it the, the bee's milk. It comes from one of the worker bees or the nursing, um, the worker bees that comes from a gland in their head actually mixed together. They can't seem to reproduce it or th synthesize it, um, but it's so rich in everything. Mm. And um, I've never tried it. You and told me that it's lovely. Minerals, antioxidants, all <laughs> right? kinds of amino acids. I mean, it's, uh, and that's what you get if you're the queen, I guess. You yeah, get the, the royal jelly. That's yeah. where yep. the queen grows so much bigger. Mm -hmm. And that queen, it helps that queen to live to almost three three years, I believe. Three years, where the right. worker bees wow. are three months. Yeah, yep. three years. That's right. And yeah. then the drones, only six to seven weeks if they're born in the spring or summer. Yeah, at the But most. if they're lucky in autumn, they get four to six months. Yeah. Because they have less work to <laughs> right. do, so it all depends. I was fascinated finding out that they um, that hydrogen peroxide is a byproduct of mm -hmm. the honey making. So it's yeah. great for wounds, for um, for That's, that bar as a wound yeah, barrier. They secrete hydrogen peroxide right. and different uh, reactive oxygen species, oxidation. Oxidation is like great for wounds. I spent a lot of time. I spent my career in wounds, and. Um, it's very exciting. And uh, one of the things that we learned a lot about was the medicinal uses of a particular type of honey called Manuka honey that comes from a Manuka tree. Um, in and New Zealand, right? In New Zealand, New Zealand. only grown in New Zealand. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it has some interesting wound healing capabilities um, in the right concentrations and in the right product. Um, you really can see it's very good for debriding, getting rid of old um, tissue that no longer should be there. And um, also, it, really sealing the wound, it seals it off, and then no bacteria can grow. And uh, so it's, I understand it's been used in history for years as an yes, medicinal thing for wound healing. Healer, yes. Good for your skin, your hair. Well, you can see up there the nine healthy benefits. I mean, it's an antiseptic, certainly for skin health, and antibacterial, that's why it's so good for wound healing. How many of us have used it for when we have a cough, like a little lemon juice, a little honey? Honey in your tea. Yeah, throat, sore throat. Soothe a cough, sore throat, things like that. Uh, great for your digestion, so energizer, athletics, and things like that. So anyway, honey's great, and um, we have a special uh, treat for you, actually. We invited an actual queen bee from the hive. We've asked her to come here and give us a little perspective of what it's like to be living in the hive. So I'd like to introduce queen bee Carlina. Thank you for coming here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're delighted to have you and come and give a perspective of what it's like to be a queen bee. I think being a queen bee is such an amazing role. I really appreciate my drone workers and my worker bees. Oh. I, I love that my worker bees, they clean the hive and they feed the babies and they, they make the nectar and they go out to get the pollen and the nectar. Well, you've got them working real hard for you, don't you? <laughs> and they treat you really well, don't yeah. they? Yeah. What do they do for you? Well, they make the honey. Uh, it, they make the honey from the nectar, and they make us the special royal jelly and feed it to me. Oh, you lucky oh. dog. And did you know I can lay like, um, 1,500 eggs per day? Wow. <laughs> That's wow. a lot. That's that a, is a lot of eggs. That's a big job for a queen, right? Uh-huh. Do you enjoy being the leader of the hive? 
love being the leader. The queen bee? Uh-huh. I'm bigger than all the other bees. Now, there's something I heard about uh, how bees communicate that very few people know about, how they tell other bees where the nectar is, the new flowers and plants. Could you tell us something about that? Yes. The dance that they do is called the waggle. The waggle? The waggle. The waggle. The waggle, the waggle is when one bee goes to a big patch of flowers that haven't been pollinated and still have lots of nectar. They go and to back to the hive and they do the waggle, which is a dance. Could you, Can you so show that's, us that's that dance? Giving the navigation, <laughs> sort of the GPS co coordinates where it is? Sure. Okay, let's see the GPS waggle. <laughs> and that's actual. Yeah. That is and so I heard, incredible. depending on how many circles they do and how fast they do, it's all giving different coordinates, navigational coordinates, you know, communications, right? Yeah. That's amazing. You're exactly correct. Thank you. Well, I've heard that uh, the hives are struggling these days, and, you know, there's some difficult times with uh, some environmental toxins and all kinds of things. Could you tell me what's going on there? Yes. You, you know, some of the bees, they go to the flowers and they collect the pollen and nectar and that has pesticides. Pesticides. Yeah, and they bring it back to the hive and they feed it to the babies and me. Oh, my. And, yeah. You're getting poison, are you saying? Yes, I'm exactly saying that. And they start getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And I, they feed it to me too, and I can't lay as many eggs as I used to lay. Oh. Yeah. Well, so you won't feel like you're the real 100% queen if you can't lay all those eggs, right? Exactly. So what message do you have to we the humans out here, the human race, or what, what she, we should know about? My message is, help us. You need us, and we need you. We're one. And, <laughs> and if... As Albert Einstein once said, if the bees were to disappear, the human race would may only li live four more years. Wow. Well, that just shows how dependent we are on bees. A lot of us take it for granted. We don't really, you know, we just don't know a lot about bees, most of us. We just eat our foods, drink our coffees, right, Heather? And don't think about where it comes from. We don't think exactly. And also, uh, where it might not come from anymore if bees were to disappear. Exactly. And that's yeah. a short period of time for things to collapse. Yeah, it sure so is. Plant your flowers. <laughs> right. So I want to thank you for your uh, insightful uh, uh, message to all of us. And I think hopefully it makes us all more aware of what's going on with the beehives, that they could be compromised. They could be lost completely. And it's going to affect all our foods out there. And uh, so thank you very much, Queen Bee Carlina. You're thank welcome. Thank you for joining us. OK? Well, it's nice to have a queen bee come and visit us and give us that little perspective, Heather, right? That doesn't happen very often, no. No, she left her them. hive. And, uh, but uh, I think just to you know, summarize some of the key points of this is that don't take nature for granted and all these foods and things that you know, come onto our kitchen and, and into our living room and things like that. I mean, 33%, 40 50% of all our crops need these pollinations. What, were ha what would happen if the bees collapsed, Marlisa? No food. No when food. We, and everything would just trickle down and we would be in big trouble. I mean, we'd be needing <laughs> wheat and corn would be left, and so, but that's all the great fruits and vegetables. Can you imagine a world without chocolate? No. Uh, no. Can or you? coffee. <laughs> coffee. <laughs> For me. Tea or any of these foods. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, so Well, I thank think you for bringing this up. I think this is a great topic that yeah. I think more and more people will become interested as they learn more. And uh, it was great to be able to talk about this today. It was so good, good to have yeah. you. Well, it was great. Thank and you. your enthusiasm would just spread like wildfire. Flyer. Wild Wildflowers that, wild gonna, flowers. <laughs> that you're going to be planting, right? Well, that's the buzz around health buzz, and I hope you enjoyed our show. Don't take bees for granted. They are crucial and important to our survival. And, uh, you know, anytime again, as Heather said, you're drinking that coffee, that tea, that eating those blueberries, apples. Remember the work that had to go on by those bees, that teaspoon of honey, just to produce all these foods. Never take nature for granted. As we move off into the digital age, so many of us are missing out on walking through nature and understanding our past, right? Absolutely. And take a walk through the garden. Yes. Visit the garden.
Thank you for joining us on Health Buzz. Thank you very much. Good day.